Good evening and a warm welcome to AHSS Presents, a conversation with Anya Hinmarsh. My name is Stefan A.R. orschel reed I'm the course leader for fashion design at Cambridge School of Art, ARU. We are extremely excited to have Anya with us here today to talk about sustainability in the fashion industry and the future of retail. Please note that the session today will be recorded. Please be rest assured that if your cameras are off, you will not feature in the recording of session. If you ask a question, as we would very much welcome you to, this will appear in the recording. If you do have any questions, please do use the chat function and post your question. At the end of Anya's talk, we will give Anya the opportunity to answer questions. So Anya, over to you. Perhaps you could introduce us to your work and to your brand. Well, thank you very much for having me tonight. It's, um, I wish I was with you in person. I'm missing, I'm missing out on, on real life meetings. Um, but so my name is Anya Highmarch. I'm actually um, British, even though I don't sound very British. Um, and um, I uh, started my business when I was 18 and it's a business uh, designing fashion accessories, um, which um, I have over the years opened a number of stores around the world and sell um, to wholesale customers. Uh, again around the world, um, but increasingly have become passionate about the idea of fashion with purpose. And I think that's really become my my happy place, if you like, as I as the as the brand grows. So um, so I, I love what I do. It's great fun. Um, but that's really where, where my happy place lies. Thank you, Anya. Now, what inspired your initial interest in creativity and accessory design? I think you're born with creativity sometimes. I don't know, I'm sure you, there's a, I'm, I'm, we have the endless debate along sort of nature versus nurture, but I think there's an element of, of so that's how your brain is wired probably. Um, but I think my interest in, in fashion and creativity and in particular accessories came probably from um, actually my mother giving me one of her old handbags when I was 16. And I remember being absolutely fascinated by the craftsmanship and how it was made and the leather and, the, uh, and also the way it made me feel. And I think that's what's so interesting about fashion. It, it really is a mood altering. Um, it's, it's, it's much more than just sort of frilly fashion. It actually really changes your level of confidence and it's quite tribal in some ways, it's self-expression. And it's also art actually in many ways as well. So it's all of those things mixed, mixed together that really appeal to me from, from a very young age. Thank you. As someone who is passionate about sustainability within the fashion industry, I'd like to ask about where your awareness to explore sustainability stemmed from. Well, I think this really goes back for me to about sort of 2006, 2007, when we were all, um, I mean, Al, Gore, Al Gore's book had just come out, and I think we were hearing the word um, you know, environment and sustainability and, and, and not really understanding quite what it meant and what we as individuals could do about it. And it was actually, it was quite a, a sort of unnerving time. I wasn't sure what difference I could make. Um, and so at that point, we were actually approached by a, an organization um, who were called We Are What We Do, who were a social change movement group who um, brought out a book which was called Change the World for a Fiver. The book was five pounds. Uh, and in the book, there were 40 actions that you could take to um, you know, to help the planet, basically. And the first action out of 40 was, wherever possible, refuse plastic bags. Um, and they came to see us to say, could we help to amplify that um, important message? And I had a bit of a light bulb moment, actually, because it made me think, actually, I can, I can use the platform of fashion. I can use, if you like, the platform of the it bag, in a way, to actually, you know, change people's behavior towards the misuse of single-use plastic. So I think that's really where it all began. Thank you. In 2007, you launched the I'm Not a Plastic Bag Totes, the same year you won the Designer Brand of the Year at the British Fashion Awards. At that time, did you see customers already desiring to make more ethical purchases? Um, yes, I mean, I think between the two projects, so we launched the I Am Not a Plastic Bag project in 2007, and that had the very simple aim of awareness around the endless misuse and taking too many plastic bags. Um, and we were trying to encourage people to reuse, we were trying to encourage reuse um, and um, so an, an awareness of the problem. When, um, and, and it had a, a phenomenal effect. I mean, I, I don't know if people might, might know the project, but I mean, 80,000 people queued in one day for that project um, and it rolled on around the world. I mean, 30 people went to hospital in Taiwan for stampede. I mean, it was crazy. Gosh. 
you know, Tokyo, I was locked in a basement for my safety, it was mad. And of course we stopped at the moment, it kind of got out of hand. Um, but the point is that actually that project made a difference because the, I think the British Retail Consortium estimated that prior to the project, I think about uh, 10.6 um, uh, million, a million or million, million probably, bags were used a year. And I think it went down to about 6.1. So it made a very significant difference in terms of the, the, the awareness. However, we came, um, all the way back to 2020 and realized that actually the problem had still really not gone away. Um, and so we wanted to uh, change the conversation to reignite the project, um, but around a slightly different subject, which is one of circularity, which is actually there's 8 billion tons of plastic on the planet right now, apparently. Um, how can we stop that going into landfill and into the oceans? Uh, and how can we turn that into, some, into something that's really beautiful that people want to continue to wear so saving it from landfill and keeping it in circulation as opposed to going straight into landfill. So that was really the inspiration uh, uh, behind the I am a plastic bag, which obviously is a sort of a, 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 the next iteration of the project. Um, and I think there is a, a huge interest from, um, well, from everyone and customers to have a sustainable alternative. Um, I think there's, there's, they still want the easy sustainable or the attractive sustainable alternative. They're not prepared to make massive sacrifices but it's therefore i feel my job as a designer to come up with an alternative that's still lovely and desirable but is is the better option so um, it feels like it's an important moment in the mid 2000s i found the fashion industry wasn't yet taking great interest itself in its own waste crisis an initiative i began at the royal college of art at the time faced quite a bit of resistance and a lack of interest indeed in sustainability from their students what made your approach to sustainability compelling well i think um i think probably using the platform of the it bag which is a sort of platform i i've always hated that idea but that formula if you like which is that it's on the right arms um, it's not necessarily in plentiful supply. Um, in this case, it was affordable as well, which made it sort of quite potent so that, you know, pretty much anyone could afford a five pound bag. That sort of combination of scarcity and, and all the right sort of celebrity wearing it made it very desirable. So the, it's amazing how celebrity, of course, can amplify. So I think, and, and, and I hope an element of our brand, of course, in there as well, of people wanting to have a designer bag at a more sort of affordable price. So that, that combination of things, I think, got traction um, and meant that people, um, you know, wanted to be part of it. And even if they were part of it for the wrong reason, um, they unwittingly were walking around with something that's saying, I'm not a plastic bag. And I, I loved in particular all the copies that we had. Um, I've seen it, trend I have them all framed and my office actually translated into Mandarin and into, into Spanish and, and um, you know, into um, uh, Cantonese, all the different sort of languages, you know, the same message. So it's sort of just spreading wider and wider. So I think that's how it got traction. And I think it, it, it then really did sort of spiral, which was fantastic. Progressing from the mid 2000s to now, I see that there has been a large shift in awareness of sustainability by both the industry and our customers. What has brought this about? Well, I think, I mean, it's the need, I think, partly. Um, I think that, you know, the more we learn and understand, the more terrifying it is, frankly. I mean, I'm probably scared at the moment. I think it's, you know, when you start seeing as we, we are now, quite regularly floods and, um, you know, heat waves and um, fires. Um, I think that if you imagine, and I think we need to imagine, that's gonna become a very regular occurrence. I had my first climate um, incident, I would say in London, in our shop in Sloane Street, where, you know, we had five feet of water in the basement and every store near us had the same thing. And in the street I live in in London, that's the cross street, again, um, flooded. And, you know, you suddenly realize you live on a floodplain, it's pretty unsustainable. That has quite significant differences and changes in, in the sense that, you know, that means that actually parts of London are, are not the best bet. You know, that changes where people want to invest, it changes where people live. You know, people, there's migration, if, you know, places are too hot or there's too many fires or floods. So it has a very significant, um, uh, you know, effect on lives potentially. So I think, I think people are starting to wake up and realize that this is, this is definitely a threat. I think there's been so much debate around you know, is this nature, is this nurture, is this going to happen anyway? And I think people sometimes bury their head in the sand. I think the reality is now people accept that this is a very, very real threat. And it's just a question of how much they're prepared to change their lifestyle now 
um, to, to, to nudge it off. And often people can't connect with the future until it's under their nose. Um, and that's where I think creativity can hopefully uh, make a difference for communication. And it's amazing what we all achieved during COVID. You know, if, if someone had said to us all, that we'd work from our homes, not leave, not be allowed out of our houses, um, and to not send our children to school, not go to our places of work for the best part of a year, we would have laughed, but it's amazing what you can do, not see our families on Christmas day, you know, really significant changes, but um, we can, and we're gonna have to make some significant changes. So I think people are waking up to the reality, I hope. Despite being trendy, what is the importance of sustainability as a term to you now? I wish it was more trendy, actually. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think the word sustainability is, is you know, is often misused, as I know you and I have just sort of discussed before. I think for me, sustainability is about, um, I mean, I almost want to replace it with two words, actually, which is common sense, which is, you know, it makes no sense to, um, you know, to, to have huge sort of carbon emissions for the sake of something that if you could eat locally, why are we flying stuff in? You know, if we can actually um, distribute our food locally from something that's grown nearby, you know, why are we sort of moving all this stuff around and having all these carbon emissions? Um, you know, if we can have our supply chains more localized, if we can wear things for longer, I mean, it makes, in, in the area that I'm in, the bit that, that upsets me particularly is the idea that you buy something. In fashion, we, we use it for a very short period of time, and then it goes straight into landfill. And that is properly mad. I mean, that's so bad for, for, for the health of the soil, which is what sequester carbon, it's what actually grows our crops, it's what keeps our climate um, safe. Um, so we've got to think differently. This, this, this um, short-termism and this, this um, kind of lacking in common sense lifestyle is, is really, it's, it's got to change I and mean, it has to change. Um, so for me, being sustainable is about applying common sense and living in a way that actually respects the planet and the soil, um, which sequester the carbon and not interfering with nature. So it's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> That's great, thank you. In 2019, you became a Greenpeace ambassador. What has this meant to you? Well, I mean, Greenpeace is the most phenomenal uh, organization. Um, and so it's a great honor to, to be asked and be involved. And I think it's about being um, someone who sort of speaks for them and, and, um, and you know, is, is vociferous about um, making a difference. And, and Greenpeace is, is, you know, not only, uh, it's all aspects of, of, of nature and planet and, and, and of, of course the environment and the, the health of the planet. So, um, so for me, it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to contribute to, um, and um, and I'm obviously very passionate about this area. And I mean, I'm learning, by the way. I'm I'm no expert. I'm simply looking at it from the outside. I hope applying common sense, um, and just trying to realise that and communicate and use my platform to to make a difference. In the West, consumers are now well aware of sustainability. London's own broadsheets, indeed, contain sections on the environment and sustainability. In emerging markets, there is still a lot to do to bring attention to the importance of sustainability to consumers. I've taken part in roundtable debates and contributed to some white papers submitted to governments in these regions. What do you believe needs to be done to achieve greater awareness of the importance of sustainability and environmental protection in these emerging markets? Um. Well, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a really hard one, isn't it? Because you've got this sort of ecosystem of business and you've got the, um, you know, and you've got the environment. It's trying to actually, um, you know, make sure that, that people still have jobs, they still have food on the table, um, whilst also, uh, and you can imagine if, you know, if you're someone who really can't afford to feed your children and by cutting down a few trees, you can, it's going to be pretty difficult, I mean, you know, to, to actually to resist that. So I think that, um, you know, it's going to be about deals where governments from developed countries probably subsidize um, governments from, from undeveloped countries to, to actually uh, make them behave in a way that's better for the environment, the bigger picture than, than perhaps the, the individual. Um, so that's probably about mutual support. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's going to be so many uh, different actions we're going to need to take, um, which are going to have to be about about sort of, you know, eco, not ego. You know, this is not about boundaries and territories and individuals and, and companies. Um, I also do think though, that we need to, uh, where we can preserve, I mean, we need to preserve jobs and, and livelihoods. So one of the things I'm quite passionate about is saying that we don't need to be scared about making um, profit and, and being successful because that actually allows companies to, well, to pay tax for starters, which, you know, in, in turn is probably the biggest way and collectively governments are probably more likely, and we're seeing this at COP, 
to be able to do the big stuff and we can all stop using plastic and do our bit as individuals, which can make a massive difference, of course, uh, and it can encourage behavior and we can put pressure on companies and, and so on and so forth. But actually, you know, the biggest, you know, it's money that often speaks and it's about, um, you know, paying people not to deforest probably. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there's a number of things we all need to, to look at, but we need to make sure that we don't, we don't just sort of sit at home and, and live on vegetables because then the whole economy will dissolve and that won't work either. So we've got to find, we've got to pick our way through this quite carefully. Do you think it, the, the crux in these markets is around education? Do you think it's government-led initiatives or NGO-led initiatives, or is it a more complex network of solutions that might prove more effective? I think it's going to be lots of different things. I mean, I think it can also be. I mean, one of the things I, I've seen is that, you know, you go to trade fairs where you're buying materials. In my case, I might go to leather, to leather fair. And if one stand of someone selling their leather, leather, which is actually, you know, made in a responsible way that doesn't use too much water, that um, doesn't use toxic chemicals and so on, if that stand's getting all the business, everyone else will copy pretty quickly. So it's funny how changes can happen very quickly and it can just be down. I mean, profit's a great, you know, carrot. Um, so there's lots of ways, you know, we need to be, we as customers need to demand, spend our money with people who are responsible. And in turn, everyone else will sort of follow in that sort of vortex, I think, probably. I think obviously governments can, you know, they can subsidize behavior that is that is that damaging globally, that's, you know, to make it not about the individual, but to actually try and help them. I think there's education. I mean, what's amazing is, you know, the kids are, I mean, without a doubt, it's been the younger generation that's led this. I mean, it's, it's humiliating, I think. Uh, and brilliant. I mean, I'm so, I think it's completely amazing that there's been this real power. Um, and so there's all sorts of ways you can, you can change behavior. And, and, and I, I would argue fashion is one of them, you know, fashion and creativity to make it cool, which sounds incredibly trite, but to make it cool to behave in a way that is actually responsible is really great. Um, and I've, I've loved some of the project we just launched recently, this Return to Nature project, which is this biodegradable and, and we hope compostable, I get the results next week, compostable bag. Um, you know, I've had so many lovely messages from so a lot of sort of between 20 and sort of 30 year olds going, this is the coolest thing you've ever done, you know, which is really nice. Um, so they totally get it. So there's lots of ways to infiltrate. And I think it needs to be a multi-pronged attack, basically. As early as 2001, or perhaps, in fact, even earlier, you connected your brand to charitable causes. Could you tell us about some of those charitable causes? Um, yeah, I mean, we've done lots and we still do lots of um, projects. Um, for me, it just feels second nature to, to want to do that, to in some way to try and, um, you know, relate a project to something that, that sort of makes sense. So, for example, when we launched back in, I think, 2001, um, a project called Beer Bag, which is uh, I think it was the first um, digital printing of, of, uh, of, of people's personal images onto, onto bags. Um, and we did that to benefit breast cancer charities, we, which we did all over the world, actually, quite substantially, actually. It was a really lovely project. Um, and since then, we've done lots of um, projects. We are, for example, launching, actually, in December, we're taking over the whole of Grosvenor Square in London, and we're planting 25,000 illuminated roses. So it's this field of illuminated roses. And you can come and you can, um, and, and we're doing this with a number of partners, but you can come and dedicate um, a rose with a personalized message um, for someone you might have lost uh, to benefit the Royal Marsden Cancer Charity. Um, we have done lots of projects for, um, in lockdown, we did a project for hospital gowns um, for um, two, two hospitals. Um, we did a project for um, intensive care units where they needed a, a, what they call a holster to carry all their things during, during the kind of COVID sort of peak pandemic. Um, lots and lots of different things. We're, we're, the Return to Nature project I spoke about a minute ago, which is um, all about, um, the idea of making something that could never need landfill, which is, you know, having worked so much on the idea of how can you encourage reuse, but also how can you save plastic from landfill, really made me think, actually, could I make something that actually would never need landfill? Because in nature, there's no waste. You know, if an animal dies, it, it falls on the ground and it gets eaten and it gets absorbed into the soil and it becomes nutrients. And actually, could I make a bag that would do the same? So we've launched that project, um, which I'm passionate about. And um, and that's benefiting, um, there's a donation for each bag to DIRT, which is a charity that supports regenerative farming uh, and soil health. Um, so, so yes, lots, lots more than I can probably mention here, but lots of projects. Thank you, Anya. And we'll certainly look forward to seeing how the compostable um, research progresses. I believe that the impacts to our lives from COVID 
and the lockdowns that followed have affected us all to reevaluate what is important in our lives. Perhaps it's reaffirmed the importance of family, of wellness, mental health, and an appreciation of mindfulness. Do you believe that this has changed our purchasing values, perhaps moving our interest away from disposable fast fashion to a connection with artisanal work and ethical purchases? I think it was a real circuit break, actually, uh, COVID. And, and I mean, I think I've, I've hoped I've always been, I mean, you know, reasonably responsible where I can, but I really got more local than ever. Um, and I think that um, it really made me realise, and I think certainly talking to all of my sort of, you know, colleagues and, and, and peer group and family and so on, that, that actually I don't need all the stuff that we all sort of frantically sort of rush around trying to, to acquire to make me happy. That's not what makes me happy. Um, and I think that I wrote a book about it in lockdown, actually. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's made us all kind of reconsider what really matters. And I think that we often think things actually are important and they're much less important than you think. So I think it made us think about locality. It made us think about um, what really is true happiness. Um, and it made us reevaluate. So we must remember the learnings from that. It's very easy to forget that as we all race back into normal life. But um, it's really important to take note of you, by the way. I grew up with parents who were at the forefront of the research into what was then called human ecology, who pioneered recycling, sustainable business solutions and alternative energy. I was taught that making sustainable choices in business will always be the savvy decision. Addressing the social, economic and environmental pillars of influence. When I launched my own brand in the late 2000s, this proved true. My sustainable choices to use dead stock textiles helped me keep the costs down and kept the textiles out of landfills. That said, being a fully sustainable brand can be a difficult remit to fulfill. What advice would you give to young creatives who are exploring sustainable choices for their work? Um, well, I'm, and by the way, I'd love to have met your parents. They sound so cool. <laughs> um, I think that, um, I mean, it, it's, it, it, I keep going back to common sense. It makes so much sense. I mean, I mean my father, when I've had a plastics business, ha ha, which is hilarious given what I do, but, um, and he used to make all of his plastic items out of recycled yogurt pots because it was cheaper. You know, it sort of, it makes sense, you know, that sort of that um, reuse and reuse. Uh, we did a big project called Waste Not Want Not, looking at all the, the offcuts, because there's so much waste in fashion, it's unbelievable. You know, you, you cut a square, but you know, the skins are not square. So what do you do with the other bits? And we made a whole collection, had a wonderful reaction for people. And I think there's been a real move towards embracing offcuts as a, as a real as badge of honor in a way. Um, I think my advice would be, you know, just get started. Just do one thing. And I, I'm, I, I spend my life saying loudly, I'm not perfect. There's bits of my business that are not perfect. And the reason being that um, that bit, I can't find a better version yet. But if I take that away, I'm going to lose business. So I'm, I'm chipping off every single bit I can. That might be my packaging. It might be the fabrics that are recycled. It might be the dead stock. It might be a, ca a fashion calendar, which we spend a lot of time thinking about because the calendar was making us deliver winter stuff in summer and summer and winter, and it's mad, and we've just stopped doing that. Um, you know, just, just start would be my advice, because once you start, but like if you go to the gym, you start eating better. You know, it's a sort of, there's a sort of a, a amazing progress. So, um, you know, in my personal life, I started in my bathroom. I thought I couldn't, I had one day when I had a conditioner and a shampoo and a toothpaste and a body lotion, all that plastic. And I was like, what was this mad? And, you know, now I, I get refills for everything. And I, you know, I've just done a different approach. And if you start in one area, it bleeds into the next. And I think it's the same in business. So just start by saying, could I do this with recycled fabrics? Could I do this in a way that has less waste? Could I do this more locally? You know, could I do this so I'm using up dead stock? You know, just keep chipping away at things and it becomes a bit of an addiction actually in a way. It often saves you money. I mean, it makes absolute sense. So get started and don't be scared if you're not perfect. So essentially, it's better to do something small in a sustainable way than nothing at all. They always say that, that, um, that perfection is the enemy of good. And I think that's, the, that's what you want to think about. So just get going. Thank you. For any young designers who want to apply sustainable approaches to their brand, are there any useful supporting organizations that you would recommend them to approach? Yeah, well, the British Fashion Council is fantastic. Um, and they have a, um, a, a part of the British Fashion Council, which is called, I think, the, um, 
the Institute for Positive Fashion, I think it's called. Um, and there's so much information um, on the website that you can, and lots of kind of people to connect to. Um, and I think in every part of, um, you know, the, the, so for me, there's, for example, in leather, there's the Leather Working Group, who are an organization. So, I mean, I just dig, 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 dig. And it's amazing online these days. And my, when I started my business, I had to use yellow pages. Now you can go on the internet and find anything anywhere. So you can just do so much research. But the British Fashion Council is a very good place to start for fashion, I think sustainability itself picking up on what we touched on earlier has arguably become a buzzword and as such the term perhaps has lost its power certain brands market their own greenwashing strategies under the banner of sustainability or arguably to only address sustainability to satisfy their own corporate social responsibility requirements do you believe there is a better term to better represent true sustainability? Well, I always like the term responsibility, really. I think that's important. But I think, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, what I always, I mean, ultimately where it gets to is we should all know our own carbon footprint, be that our, our company or our, ourselves. And there's, rather than spend an awful lot of money on having that done, there's some very easy sort of carbon calculators online where you can just put in, do I drive a car? Do I, do, you know, you can put in what you do and it will give you a rough estimate of what your carbon emission, personal carbon emissions are. Um, and what I always think is quite good is, is imagine that, you know, you're going to get a bit wrong, so just overstate it. And I mean, if you could afford to offset that, I don't believe in offsetting everybody actually, but as a first step to sort of say, right, I'm going to become carbon neutral as an individual or as a company. Um, what that does is it makes you, first of all, a very, well, first of all, you've at least not done the damage, <laughs> or at least you, you've slightly offset the damage. Then it makes you think next, how can I reduce? You know, you look at the pinch points of where you're, you're spending effectively more carbon. How can I reduce that? And there's, it's amazing, once you sort of get going, it makes you very aware. And I think that's, that's I think the, the term responsibility is best. And I think if everyone has a, a chance to kind of start by assessing what is your carbon footprint, um, that's, that's a really good place to start. If I'm correct, um... The WWF has an online carbon footprint generator. I think might do as well. Yeah, there's a number of them. And they're very simple. And I think it's best to be kept simple, actually, because ultimately, you know, it's hard to, to, to work out exactly. But if you kind of get the number of X and you sort of do at X plus 10 percent, um, and there's a very good you, you can offset and, and choose a, the UN. I use the UN quite a lot just because I sort of feel it's regulated. We often offset using the UN programs. Um, there's an awful lot of charlatans in that business, by the way, so be careful. But, um, you know, it's nice to know. And also it's hard to know how much one tree does offset. So the whole thing's a little bit of an imperfect science, but I think that's quite a nice thing to do. So at least you kind of go, OK, well, I haven't done damage damage, but actually now how can I reduce? Um, and it, there's a conundrum, honestly, about, you know, we can all get our businesses to reduce our carbon. But ultimately, if you want a growing business, which is what we need, because we want tax to be able to pay for, you know, the developing countries, all the things we spoke about already, we are going to need to have a combination of offsetting and production um, and, and technological advances, of course, which is where we, what we need all you brilliant creative students to achieve. Um, so I think that it's worth kind of getting familiar with offsetting programs. Thank you. What do you see as the future of sustainability within the creative industries or the fashion industry? Are there any new emerging approaches that we should be aware of? Well, I think, I mean, there's going to be several things. Really. I think there's going to be a change of behaviour, which is reducing how we, you know, reducing carbon emissions. There's going to be, um, there's going to be, uh, you know, offsetting. And then there's going to have to be some sort of amazing, um, brilliant brainwave, which I'm praying someone comes up with. Uh, and, and there are some incredible things that you're reading about of, of, of sequestering carbon and how we might do that. Um, and I mean, you could argue in, in also in the... Um, in trying to reduce our carbon footprints, actually, could we, you know, should there be a carbon tax, for example? And the fact you're buying this from China and it's badly made with fossil fuels <coughs> at three pounds, you're buying this from the UK, it's well made and it's six pounds. And we should actually, the one in China be, you know, like cigarettes, if the prices are inflated <coughs> to make you buy the one that's better. Uh, now that has a lot of far reaching consequences. So I'm not suggesting that you could jump to that because, you know, that starts to really mess up business and in a major way but actually is that the right thing like we do with cigarettes probably ultimately um at least in the interim could there be a traffic light system for example where um you know you at least know you're making a good choice or a bad choice so you know in the way that we now are quite clear i think on the food that we buy does it have e-numbers um is it um you know has it been flown in from from wherever 
you can see and it's it's transparent so i think that actually fashion we need to be as fussy about what we wear as we do um what we put in our mouths effectively so i think some transparency in the traffic light system will be a really good interim system as well thank you are there any sustainable brands with innovative approaches that you're a fan of if it's okay to ask Brands, yeah, I mean, so many. I mean, I think, you know, Stella's doing a great job. Gabriella Hurst is doing a brilliant job um, in awareness as well as actions, actually. Um, there's a lot of really great small, I mean, Phoebe English, I think, is doing some wonderful work. I mean, there's so, so many. Um, and there's some really cool developments. And we're working on our Return to Nature project. I wanted to find a way to protect the leather, because otherwise it just would, you know, go brown in the rain and so on. And normally leather is always coated in an element of PU. That's what happens. That's why when you smell your handbag, it doesn't really smell like leather. And when it rains, the rain just rolls off. It's because it's coated in leather. And pretty much that's all leather. I wanted to find a way to make a very natural leather that didn't have this plastic coating. But actually, I work with these people who've, who've actually developed this liquid silk as a coating, which is something that's going into cosmetics and it's starting to go into fabrics and it's a natural coating to protect that isn't isn't plastic. Um, so brands, yes, loads, but also incredible developments um, that just mean that you can have more natural, uh, less polluting um, uh, materials that go into products as well as brands. Throughout your career, you have been an entrepreneur, indeed winning Viv Clico as Businesswoman of the Year 2012. What do you believe are the keys to successful entrepreneurial initiatives? Um, uh, well, I think, you know, it, being an entrepreneur is very simple. Um, you know, it's about buying something or making something and selling it for more than you buy or make it. That's all it is. Um, and I think often people make it out to be kind of complicated and scary. And there are complicated and scary moments. But ultimately, I think even working for someone these days is quite complicated and scary. It's not the same, the same world that it was where you had a sort of job for life. Um, so I think it just takes, um, you know, that approach of, I think I've got a good idea. And by the way, it has to be a good idea. It's not a hobby. This. this is a good idea that has a market. So if you have an idea, great if it's a nice idea, but actually will it sell? Do people want it? And do they want to pay what you can afford to make it for? And if, if that's the case, then I think everyone should go for it. It takes, of course, um, I mean, it's, I always talk about it as a great game of chess. It's super exciting. Every day is like a lucky dip. Um, but it's also like a kick in the stomach every hour. <laughs> I just mean, it's, it's not easy. Um, but I think it's uh, it's a really fun way to work, and you you're able to kind of create your own world and your own, you know, your own causes and your own um, culture, which is which is really lovely. Um, but I think it takes determination. Probably if I was to answer your question with one word, I think that's probably the word that it, that's the, the, that's what it needs. Would you advise? graduates these days to launch their own business or to work for a company? I'd say start your own business immediately because, and I'd even advise graduates to start while they're at university because while you're in a program, you have holidays, you have lots of times, you also have all the amazing um, facilities you have at university <laughs> um, that you know you can use and all the advice you have from tutors. And, and you know I think that's the perfect place to start a business where you've also got a dedicated community that you can sell to. So. You know, and frankly, if you if you have a product that doesn't sell to your community there, um, then it's not really going to work. Do you know what I mean? That's where you have influence and where you have a sort of you know captive audience. So, I think that I'm a great believer in in just getting going. And I think that these days it's all about direct to consumer. I think that the passion of going to work in a design house or one of the brands or labels is lovely, but actually most of the time it can be a sort of delay tactic. If you really want to start your own business, just, just do it. Thank you. It's a really innovative answer. Um, thank you for that. Now, in May this year, you launched The Village in Pont Street, London. Could you tell us more about this initiative? Um, so, well, we've had over the years probably up to about 60 stores around the world, plus all of our wholesale partners and so on. And I felt really that actually um, the idea of having lots of stores all the same, sort of cookie cutter stores all around the world, no longer feels that modern, given the, the you know, incredible development of, of the internet. So um, I actually wanted to have this sort of urge to reduce the number of stores we had. I slightly felt it didn't feel very authentic because you know the girl that was running the shop in Singapore, I hadn't met and the girl in LA was you know different and hadn't had the training and the same window scheme didn't really work in Malaysia as it did in, in Hong Kong. And it just, it just felt sort of not very authentic. And I had this urge actually to, go back to being more local and less global. And it's funny, I'm sure this is tied in, I think, to the way we're all thinking really, which is that you know, my entire career has been to the backdrop of that word globalization, you know, global distribution, global supply chains. Um, and you know, you might make one part of something in, you know, in, in Italy and another part embroidered in India and it might be finished in, in 
the Philippines I'm making it up but you know you would you think nothing of having a sort of supply chain that was actually sort of multi-part multi-country and I just don't know if that feels right anymore honestly so my, my urge this magnet for me was to come back to being more local um, and I wanted to go back to the street Pont Street which is in in Knightsbridge in London which is where I had my very first ever store um, my office is in the basement or 15 of us crowded into the basement um, and for me I wanted to go back to actually having this little group of stores we've got five stores and a little cafe there um, where I'm there all the time where I'm changing the window to space myself where it's a it's not so much a shop it's more of it's sort of the concepts happen there the the ideas the platform for discussion so they're much more conceptual stores um, and you know for example in launching the return to nature project we've taken over one of the stores completely and we've actually had these incredible people who work with um uh never say the word terranium yeah um where it's this ecosystem we've got this giant terranium that's all sort of full of mold and and and, and put the bags in showing live biodegrading products and you know and so it's actually an exhibition space but then Opposite that, we're going to set up a children's Christmas grotto where we've got a thousand children booked in to, to do some lovely creative story. And, you know, so it's just a conceptual, experiential world, um, which I think is a nice engagement for brand. And it gives me a chance in terms of content and in terms of meeting customers and discussing what we care about. And the cookie cutter stuff we can do online in a way. So it's not, um, so it's a different model. Uh, and for me, that felt right. I'm sure it's different for every single brand in the world, but for me, that felt right and it's quite exciting. As a customer myself, I mean, what you've just described sounds extremely exciting. It sounds to be educational and it, it would make the shopping not just a destination, but a, a sort of learning experience as well. Yeah. So very exciting. Thank I, you. I want to learn, don't you? I sort of think that's part of, for me, there's, I mean, there's so much product, isn't there? So much. But actually, I want to learn. I want to have a, I think luxury is about stories and about progression and about learning. So for me, that's what I wanted to do with this. And so it's still fun shopping, but it's but it's not what you can get online. I think retail for retail to exist in this next era, there needs to be a reason to visit. It can't just be the mm. same online. Absolutely. Now, also this year, you launched your first book, <laughs> If In Doubt, Wash Your Hair, published by Bloomsbury. Could you tell us more about what brought this book about and what it covers? Um, so I never really wanted to write a book because I'm quite a private person actually and it's a very very personal book this is not a it's not a sort of a memoir or sort of talking about fashion it's actually talking about doubt actually um, hence you know if in doubt wash your hair the word doubt in the title um, and it's interesting I think as a woman and as a creative and as a, a woman in business um, you know there's so many um, aspects of doubt that you feel daily and I don't think people are ever very honest about doubt you know the fact is anyone and everyone, whether they're the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of the UK or the best designer that anyone's ever looked up to, they are all riddled with that. That is a very, very normal part of, of progression and creativity and business. Um, and I wanted just to write a very honest account as if I was writing to my daughter actually about what I wish I'd known, I'm now 53, what I wish I'd known at 18 um, to realize that, you know, I mean, I'm a bit of an introvert. So, you know, I'm not gonna want to go to every party. That's not my thing. That's also okay, we're all different. How did I work that out? I did an online test that showed me my personality traits, which really helped me. You know, what did I, how did I, you know, navigate being a mum? How did I navigate being a stepmother? How do I cope with those creative ideas that you love? And then when you get into them, suddenly you hate them. How do you stick with that to get through that lull and come up the other side and actually end up with a, still a really good idea? So it's exploring doubt in all aspects of, of my life um, and just explaining what I wish I'd known and, and what I think has really helped me. It's basically all the things that I've learned that have been those aha moments, you know, where you're like, mm, actually, I wish I'd known that earlier. That's really helped me. So I just put it all together, um, hoping that it might help someone else too. Throughout your career, you have been an inspiring voice and a true original. What's next for Anya? <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, well, you know what? I, I mean, I, I have a, a, a head that bubbles up ideas. And I think it's funny, you, you sort of, they always say that, you know, you always worry you won't get another idea. The truth is, if you have a brain that spits out ideas, it will continue to spit out ideas. You know, creative brains do. Um, we've got a really exciting project launching in a couple of weeks, which I'm really excited about. Um, obviously collections coming up. Um, we've got so many concepts coming out into the village. Um, we're doing, it's quite fun, even the sort of the cafe part of the village, because you know, the design that goes into cakes and 
mince pies and gingerbread men and all the sort of fun little bits there's all sorts of testing but applying a sort of fashion eye to that and and a creative eye is, is just it's just a, you know it's fun um but it's also managing and growing a business and the people and um you know i was sort of say running a business is so you know you're going from a to b and you're going in that direction but it's like people are throwing bottles at you <laughs> every which way and you're just ducking and diving and just trying to keep going where you need to go that's how it feels sometimes so <laughs> that was my day to day anyway thank you so much anya we really value your immense insights that you've shared with us. Are there any other matters that you would like to tell our viewers about? Well, only that um, if your viewers, it's hard for me to see, but our, our students, um, A, I'm incredibly jealous because I never went to university and it's something that's riddled me with doubt from in for my life. So first of all, make the most of it because it's um, incredibly special to have that time to experiment and get to know what your sweet spots are. Um, which once you're sort of in a job or in business, you, you don't have so much time to really use it. Um, use those holidays. Um, that's so important as well, because actually you won't get that time again. And that gives you a chance to experiment. Start a business if you have a chance, if you have a desire to, because that's really fun. Um, and, um, and, you know, just just I think creative to be a creative and to work in creativity is such a uh, not only a pleasure, but actually a responsibility, because I think creativity is in, in, integral and imperative for not only the economy, but probably in solving many of the, the problems that we have, or at least certainly in making them palatable. If we can persuade people to behave in a different way by giving them a really exciting alternative, we'll do a great thing. And without creativity, that won't work. So there's a real responsibility there, I think. So just really lots of, lots of luck from me and, um, and you know, ditch the doubt and, and get going. Thank you, I wholeheartedly agree. We will now turn to questions placed in our chat from our viewers. Um, Sandra asks, how did you get into fashion? Um, well, really um, sort of by accident. I, I left um, school at 18 and um, didn't have many offers from university, truthfully. Um, but also I was, I'm, I'm slightly dyslexic as, as is actually quite classic for, for creative people often. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to crack on and get going. It was very much um, a time in the, in the UK where sort of Thatcher's Britain, love it or hate it, but it was a very entrepreneurial time. There was a real sort of momentum and movement towards um, business. So having been given um, that buy by my mother, as I explained when I was 16, um, I really just wanted to do that. I knew very clearly I wanted to work in fashion. Um, so I felt very lucky, because it's much easier to know what you want to do. Um, so then I really, rather than going to work for someone, I just started out in Florence in Italy, um, where I knew that was the home of leather. And I gave myself two months to do a language course, um, found a bag um, that everyone was wearing, really cool kind of sort of bucket bag um, that I thought would sell well in the UK, found a factory, my best terrible Italian through the yellow pages, um, had some samples made and took them back to the UK and sold them and then got more orders and more designs. And it really rolled from there. So it's very, it's quite simple in a way. Um, another question also from, San, uh, for, from Sandra. Anya, are you worried? about selling less due to anti-consumerism? I think that's such a great question, Sandra. And I think, um, you know, yes and no, because as a business, of course, I need to, you know, if I suddenly cut my sales in half and I've got a problem, I need to actually uh, lose some of my staff. So that isn't great. And as we talked before, we mustn't, I think we mustn't be scared to, to make businesses that employ people and contribute tax and do all the things that, you know, that's an incredibly important thing for, I think, being responsible for the environment and all the challenges we face. Um, however, I think there is a way to navigate that that is not irresponsible, which is, you know, is literally buy less, buy better um, and offering people um, solutions that are, you know, with our return to nature bag, that's a bag that can not do harm. It's, it's locally sourced. Um, it's very carefully designed and made um, and can never end up in landfill. And I hope will, well, it will last for generations. But if it didn't, it would break down. So I think there are ways to navigate that. Um, and, and we need to get there quite fast, really. In short. And it's always about balancing that economic, environmental and social spheres, really, isn't it? Exactly. exactly. Not easy. Thank you. From Leonie Moore, she asks, what places are there to purchase sustainable materials? Well, so there's a great exhibition you should go to, which is called the um, Sustainable, it's called the Future Fabrics Expo. Um, and it's, um, it's by a company called the Sustainable Angle. So if you look on Instagram and see the Sustainable Angle, they do this expo, um, I think two or three times a year. And what they do is they collate all the responsible 
um, fabric alternatives. And I just remember this amazing woman called Nina Morenzi. And I think it's game changing. So rather than going to Premier Vision or, or all the sort of various um, fabric exhibitions, this just is so easy for designers because so often trying to find the sustainable thing just takes time. And we're all these hamster wheels of, of, of deadlines. So going there, it will show you all the silks, all the wools, all the wools, all the leathers, all the, you know, all the alternatives, um, which she curates. Um, so that's a really good resource. And the more you dig into that, there's also lots of resources on that website that can show you where to go. So that's a really good one to, um, to dig into. That's wonderful. That would have been so useful know, to, to me know. at the time when I was uh, <laughs> to learning. Um, Elizabeth May, so it's very encouraging. And you know, I teach a carbon footprint course and I found it very interesting to hear from someone who's actually producing lovely sustainable products. Thank you. I'd like to come on your course, please. <laughs> uh, Jenny Lawson says, I run a 100% landfill free eco beauty salon in Chelmsford. I struggle advertising the eco aspect as it's normal to me, what is the best way to talk about it? I think that's a really good question. Yeah, well, I mean, it, well, I mean, that's so incredible and it's so not normal. So I think you've got to see it from the outside, not through your eyes. So it might be worth, in a way, having someone, sometimes it's quite good talking to someone who might be a good copywriter or just a friend that you trust who's good with words. Tell them all the amazing USPs from the sort of carbon perspective of your business and ask them to try and reassemble it into um, you know, one line and then a paragraph and then a page. So you've kind of got three sort of different bites at it. And I think that's something you need to shout about from the rooftops, because that's my point, that if you can go and have a beauty treatment that's not damaging the environment versus one that is, everyone's going to choose the one that isn't. I mean, it's such a badge of honour. Um, so whilst it's normal to you, you need to really shout about it, you know, for the purposes of boosting your own business, which I approve of, as, you, as I said earlier, but also because it will encourage other people. And if you get the business over people who are not doing an environmental alternative, then it'll encourage the people who, who aren't because they'll follow you a bit like the leather stand I was talking about. Really exciting. It becomes a knock-on effect where one person doing it well actually doesn't just do wonderful things themselves, it is influencing others. Yeah, yeah. Hannah Gladwin writes, do you think the pre-loved and pre-sale market for luxury helps or hinders sustainability. With some companies, they seem to be producing more to keep up with demand and to cater to resellers, or they just destroy old stock so that it doesn't get into the resale market, or those who want to make replicas. Yeah, several questions there. I mean, resale and pre-loved, fantastic. I mean, of course, I mean, I, I almost want to put a little visitor's book in my handbag saying, you know, to sort of almost track who's, who's had it a bit like a, a book, you know, it's like owned by, like in a library book. Um, and so I think, you know, pre-loved and, and resale is, is a no-brainer. And we do a lot of resale. We don't do it ourselves, but I mean, our bags are sold all the time on Vestiaire and all the various different um, platforms there are. Maybe one day we'll, we'll do it ourselves. Um, and in terms of, of um, you know, it's the same thing, really, resale and pre-loved. I think there's also rental, which is interesting. There's some debate with rental, um, I think particularly with clothing, but by the time you've moved it backwards and forwards and cleaned it all the time, that, that actually it's not as environmentally friendly as, as it seems. I'm sure it still is a benefit. It makes total sense to share what we have and to get more wear out of it. So I think, I think it's brilliant. Um, I think destroying anything is sinful. <laughs> I mean, it, I literally, that makes me weep um, because surely there's some value to someone. I mean, what are we all doing? That's mad. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's a no brainer. And I think that was, there was one big round mentioned no names that was called out on that a while back. And I, I hope that sort of stopped that certainly in the, the luxury space. Um, so I think, uh, and obviously copies, well, copies happen, don't they? I mean, you know, but the copies are often not responsibly made. They're often copies and they're done cheaply and, and it's, it's for a quick buck. So often that's not, not a good route. So you're not being responsible by buying a copy in any respect. One, because it's not respecting people's IP and all the love and creative work. And we know as creatives how much agony you put into getting it right. It's much easier to copy it than it is to actually kind of go through the process of finding the right solution. But also they don't have to be environmentally friendly options. It's very interesting that you just picked up on the rental market and how there is still a lot of steps that need to be aligned there. Um, and you perfectly outlined it by the time, you know, we don't wash our clothes every day, but the notion that when you are renting a garment, it's sent back, you know, to a, a central um, distribution center, it's dry clean at each stage. It's got the, 
the carbon footprint involved in sending it backwards and forwards. But equally, those um, are probably local steps, though, aren't they? So if you think if you're buying something, it's probably made in the Far East, a lot of it, and then it's coming over and being sold and then sort of kept and not moved a lot. But actually, um, it doesn't, it tends to end up often in landfill or, or resale. But if, it, if it's rented, you know, it's, it's got micro steps. So, I mean, I think with all these things, you know, it, there's a, already, I think that has to be a good thing because that talks about the sharing economy and that has to make sense in so many ways particularly things like cars and, um, you know, all sorts of areas. So I think it's a step in the right direction, but often these things are not quite as simple as you think. Um, but I think it's still, you know, it's an iterative process, this, you know, we have to sort of not, um, it's quite easy sometimes I find just to be sort of like, that's good, that's bad. And there's all sorts of gray in between. I think we have to be a bit realistic about exploring the gray and finding our way without, without judgment, really, as long as people are sort of trying to do the right thing. Another point on the rental market is uh, it's a question I've heard raised was, does it benefit or not to the designer, uh, particularly for being a young designer? And I've, I've heard that answered quite well in the past that, you know, it, it promotes awareness of that a designer's product. And in fact, the more complex question is that distribution um, and managing the process itself. Yeah, yeah. Now, Jenny Lawson writes, is carbon more important than landfill free? It's a shame that the beauty industry doesn't acknowledge the eco aspect as much. Mm. Well, I mean, there, there are different things, aren't there? I mean, so carbon is the problem and landfill is a problem because it damages the soil and soil is what sequests the carbon, absorbs the carbon. So, um, you know, because if you if you imagine, I mean, it's, it's such an interesting subject, this, um, because if you imagine a field that's full of, you know, plastic and waste, and I did have a pass one, the M4, there's an amazing landfill site that you drive past. And by the way, I almost think everyone, if you're interested in the subject, and really everyone is that's on the call, go and see your local landfill. Go and visit it. It's absolutely fascinating. And go and visit your local recycling centre. I mean, they're, they're fascinating places. The recycling centre is like Willy Wonka. It's amazing how they sort and separate. And it really, it really drives home what you can and can't do. And a landfill site is really pretty significant. Someone, you know, that age-old um, phrase of, you know, when you throw something away, there is no way, um, is really brought home to you. And that's why when we did the I'm... Um, not what well, I am a plastic bag project. We actually closed all of our stores in London and filled them with 90,000 used, washed, used plastic bottles to show people what eight minutes, eight seconds actually of landfill looked like. And it's kind of staggering. So when you see a landfill site and you connect people to it, you're like, oh, that's actually horrid. I'm not gonna do that anymore. And if you, if you had to bury everything in your garden that you couldn't recycle, you very quickly stop taking the, the plastic. So, but the, the bottom line is they're two different things. So landfill is terrible because it damages the, the health of the soil um, and soil is the thing that along with water and the ocean it absorbs the carbon so it's a fantastic um, way of, of solving the problem so the more we end up with this deforestation and this unhealthy soil the less we can absorb the carbon in the natural way in, in, into soil and into oceans um, so that's really really key and of course you know soil health is everything not only does it actually absorb the soil it also grows crops and, and, and supports us. Um, and then of course, carbon emissions, you know, come out of that. Um, so, so there's sort of two, two sides of the coin, if that makes sense. I'm sorry, I'm describing that very badly, but not I mean. <laughs> not at all, Anya, thank you. Victoria writes, do you think with the popularity of social media, there is a combating force of influencers doing harm against the sustainable movement, for example, taking part in fast fashion halls? Additionally, do you think fast fashion's attempt to be more su sustainable, for example, through conscious collections, are good enough? What's a, what's a sort of fast fashion haul? I don't know what that is. Fascinating. Um, I, I suppose influences um, pushing brands, pushing customers to purchase more through I their I support from sponsorship. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, we all have to think about buying less and buying better and looking after things and mending things and um, and overconsumption because, you know, we are the worst, fashion is the worst polluter. Uh, and, you know, it is, I can't remember, the most staggering stat, and I can't remember it now, which is like, we, we purchase something, we wear it for, if you if you look at, it's like something like three minutes, so if you look across all your clothes that you buy, and then it goes into landfills, it's a linear journey. Whereas if you buy something, wear it for as long as possible, you know, and buy something that's going to last there so it's well made, look after it, repair it, all the obvious things. And then actually rather than landfill, you put it back and remake it upside into something else. You know, then it becomes a circular. So it's 
difference the um, iron plastic bag project is taking those bottles, moving something that's really, really lovely you want to continue wearing. Um, so absolutely, we shouldn't, so social media can be, you know, it can be a force for good and it can be a force for, for harm. Um, but I think we should embrace it for what it can do. Uh, and do I think that, as we said earlier, fast fashion is bad? Not always. Actually, they have an amazing um, ability to change the supply chain because they are the biggest customers of, of many of these raw materials. So it can actually play a really important role. Are they always doing that? No. Um, people are often chasing profit um, at the expense of the environment. But I think what's happening is actually the customer is saying, we don't want that anymore. You know, and actually suddenly out of being shamed, um, they are changing. So there's lots of different ways to, to sort of, um, to, to, you know, turn that around, I think. Thank you. Leonie Moore writes, so what actually is being eco-friendly and sustainable? Is there a difference between the two? Uh, no, I think they're both terms that are slightly made up that are a bit sort of generic, honestly. I think we need to, I mean, long story short, is we've got to reduce the amount of carbon. Um, and, you know, the way to do that is to buy locally, um, is to, um, you know, is to be aware of your own carbon footprint, to uh, you know, to offset by planting trees, which absorb carbon, um, to not keep putting things into landfill, which stops the soil absorbing carbon. Um, so I think those two terms are, are, you know, sometimes confusing. And what people want almost is a call to action or something really clear and easy to do. Um, so I mean, I, I start by just kind of saying, you know, either reduce waste or, you know, do your own carbon footprint and sort of start to kind of become aware. Um, so sorry, it's probably not a great answer to your question, but end of a very long day for me. <laughs> Forgive me. Thank you. And Hannah Gladwin uh, writes a comment here rather than a question. Halls are cringy to her, buying <laughs> thousands of clothes in one sitting just to show them off yeah. and send them back. Why well, be embarrassed? I mean, look, the thing we need to get to now is where you kind of go, this cardigan, this old thing, I've worn it 170 times. I love it. It's my favorite thing. I've got, a, I've got an Aussie Clark dress, which I bought, which is vintage when I bought it. It's actually very expensive. It was an expensive dress because obviously it was Aussie Clark. I've worn it, I mean, a hundred times probably. Every time I wear it, I love it. It makes me feel great. And, and it's a badge of honor for me to say, this is something I bought that I loved. It was already pre-loved and I've worn it loads. And I now love, I mean, that thing of, a, you know, you don't want to wear something more than once or twice is, is just completely shaming, I think. Um, so buy beautiful things you love to bits and be proud of wearing them again and again, I think. Absolutely. If I open my wardrobe with a very small wardrobe and I find something that you know, I bought because I loved it. Of course, I want to wear it. It makes me happy. It makes me feel, again, that excitement of what attracted me in the first place. Um, if I may add a question, um, and it's about to do with, the, with these uh, products that we love and we, we keep. How important is the care of the garment by the customer um, in comparison to the footprint of that garment in the first place? Well, I think, I mean, if you care for things, they last longer. We all know that. And it's, I mean, I only got my teenage children who, you know, buy them something nice and they trample it into the ground and walk over it and don't put, hang it up. And we all know that if you put a nice jacket on a proper wide hanger that, you know, the shoulder pads don't, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of obvious, isn't it? So the better we look after things, the longer they will last. Um, and, um, and, you know, if you, if you have a respect, it's fine. I often think people don't understand how much love and energy goes into making things. In fact, we in our store in, in the village, there's a store we have called the Bespoke Store. And I actually have the craftsman in there working in the store because I really want to connect people to how things are made because people are so disconnected from the love. I mean, we know, in, you know, when you make something, it's hours and hours of work and you hand it over like your baby, like you've just made this beautiful thing. And it's heartbreaking, I think, if someone just, you know, doesn't treat it well and, you know, doesn't look after it, doesn't actually make it eke it out to make it last as long as possible. So. I think, you know, we need to be very aware of how things are made, be kind of vested in the process, be respectful and, and really sort of actually look after them. And the difference between looking after something um, and not looking after something is a huge difference in terms of the longevity. So it's sort of common sense, really. But also the cleaning of products is very important, I think, to, to learn how products should be cared for, to make sure that as yeah. you're caring for them, yeah. you're also not adversely impacting the environment unnecessarily. Totally, absolutely. And I mean, it's interesting now, there's a real move away from, you know, all the sort of traditional dry cleaning chemicals and things that, you know, we've all cleaned our things with, but actually to lemon and bicarbonate of soda and a very sort of different approach to, to a more natural cleaning process. Um, and I think that's also very interesting as well. Thank you, Anya.
Um, Jenny Lawson asks here, what do you do about Christmas and gifting? Very <laughs> topical and appropriate question for this time of the year. Uh, I, I had a, if you, if you buy my book, Jenny, you'll see that I wrote a whole chapter about this because I, I've got five kids and, um, and I got to the stage where I was just buying things to level up and to make people, and you're never sure if it's, are you spending the same amount? Is that fair or is it the same amount of excitement? Because my six-year-old at the time, a box of Lego was everything to him, but my 18-year-old was not happy unless he had a, an iPod or whatever it was. It was sort of, you know, it's very hard. And I ended up actually developing the system um, called the Christmas contract, which is a, a jokingly a sort of legalese document, which um, essentially um, uh, gives the same amount of money to every child on the sort of 1st of December. And then they go off and buy exactly what they want. But there's a set of very funny rules about, you know, we'll obviously we'll come and shop with you, et cetera, et cetera. Because I found there was so much waste. And it's terrible. It's the same with Halloween. I mean, you know, and I'm ashamed to say I did it. I actually went out, bought that pair of red horns for the silly party. And, you know, the next day, what are you going to do with them? I mean, you need to keep them until next year. But I, you don't, you know, there's so much plastic was bought overnight and all went in cycling off the bin the next day so there's a lot of waste at Christmas and I actually think we all need much less and, and now more than ever I try and do an experience with my kids actually um, so sometimes I said you know what I'm going to spend all the money we're going to have an amazing holiday we're going to do something really lovely or we're going to do an experience and go and you know see Father Christmas here or whatever it might be um, because actually they don't need that much stuff it really is it's mad equally Christmas is about memories and magic so we shouldn't dumb it down we need to have those memories and that magic but we just need to do it in a sort of slightly more sensible way Leonie Moore asks, are there any good books about sustainability that you recommend? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many books. I mean, there's um, a book I really enjoy, which is called Cradle to Cradle, which just talks about, you know, actually it's not, you know, there's, there's you know, Cradle to Gate, there's Cradle. So for example, the, the birth of a product. So if I take my, I am, I am a plastic bag, you know, the bottles all the way through to the manufacturing process, all the way through to it being sold. So at what point is it still the responsibility? Is it the point where it's at the gate, which is my warehouse going out? Or is it actually after that when it goes out to the store and then is sold to the customer and then they finish? So it's cradle to gate, cradle to cradle. And how we look at the life cycle of products, that's a fascinating one. Um, there's a, and I've got so many sitting on my desk over there. Um, what else have I loved? Uh, there's a great one. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, I forgot the name. I can I can share a list to share with you. They're all sitting over there on my desk. But there's loads of um, loads of good books, and, and you get something from each one. You know, sometimes it's not just the one. It's that everyone sort of seems to kind of. And there's great podcasts as well for a sort of slight dyslexic. By the way, um, there's some really there's one called um, Wardrobe Crisis, uh, which is really good. In fact, the Return to Nature bag actually that whole idea came out of a podcast I listened to when Arizona Muse said, you know, it's not enough for something to last a long time. Um, actually it needs at the end of its life to be left in the field and return to nature break down and become you know nutrients to the to the ground and that's made me go oh I need to try and work on that so I, I find podcasts when I'm walking really useful so fashion fashion wardrobe crisis uh, there's a number of them I can share some of you if you want to share after this thank you part of the title of this talk was the future of retail and luxury and sustainability and it, it feels perhaps that we talk more about sustainability than we have of, towards luxury is there in fact a massive difference between the two well put it this way i don't think anything is really luxurious unless it's sustainable anymore i mean how can anything be a luxury that's doing harm and that that's really i think that's the bit that hasn't quite dawned on some of, when I look at, you know, some of my friends, some of my customers, you know, sometimes, sometimes even me, you know, you sort of, you still have that thing of, oh, it's a brand, it's expensive, it's a luxury, it's luxury, you know, what does that mean? But can anything really be luxurious that's doing harm? Not really, I don't think. So how can we make beautiful things that don't do harm? That's, that's real luxury. So I think that the definitions are really sort of changing. Thank you so much, Anya. And thank you to our audience for asking really interesting and uh, provocative questions as well. Uh, Anya, I'd like to thank you very much for the time that you have given to us today. Uh, we will be uh, ending the talk very shortly. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And uh, yes, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much for having me and, um, and take you on. I hope to see you in real life soon. Very much so. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.